Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. So, I'm joined here today by Alessio. Hello. Fen. Grezzo. And I will be your host, Alexis. We'll be talking about uh, Monster Hunter World, uh, a tight boss battler, and Cry Havoc, an asymmetric deck builder. But before we start, uh, let's see how everyone is doing uh, in the Stanley catch-up. So, how have you been doing, Alessio? Oh, fine, thank you. <laughs> it was been a busy week, but uh, uh, I played a lot of uh, Lands of Gazir, so hopefully we will eventually talk about it. But uh, uh, well, I, I used this space to confess a scene of mine. So I I really underestimated the game. Uh, you know, it, it was a couple of years ago when uh, there was the Kickstarter for Challengers, which was a completely unassuming game. Uh, really, it was so inconspicuous that I, I just noticed the the contest on BGG. I put. That I put an entry there without uh, without looking it twice and forgot about it. Then uh, my kid was uh, uh, looking for illustration ideas for a bit of games to play at this birthday party. So I gave him the illustration for challengers because they were funny and cool and uh, decent for a kid to draw. And... Uh, he wanted to test that game. I sighed because I didn't like the game at all. And I bought it and it was a blast. Man, it was a blast. That game is stupid fun uh, from beginning to end. It, it, it is a small car game with a high player count which requires... It plays like a tournament of Magic the Catering, so it's beautiful. <laughs> I have to say, I'll play it a little more and then we'll tell if it's really that good on the long run but it's beautiful so that sounds really fun yeah it was fun so that's basically my my last two weeks and what about you fan frosthaven arrived a couple of days ago i spent six hours sorting it out yeah <laughs> uh, uh, including the insert uh, i took the laser ox one um very happy with it uh, it's not perfect um but the fault is actually not laser ox it's some of the inserts uh, not it's just the dividers that have been included within frost haven are in portrait format which is like <laughs> why would you do portrait format dividers um and the rest <laughs> all landscape format so i've had to make some compromises to get all of the bits and pieces to fit in um and we've been using the app as well to play, uh, the Lucky Duck app. So that's basically made all of the monster decks, the initiative tracking, uh, the loot deck, and the monster attack deck um, completely redundant, which is nice. Um, less, less decks on the board. Uh, I don't have any impressions of whether it's good or not yet, but I have been keeping my eye out on things because I do need to pay attention to what the future experience is going to be like and it sounds like once again some of the scenarios are not as well designed as they could be especially at lower hero count so we'll see um but i mean i'm kind of looking forward to the role-playing gloomhaven and miniatures kickstarter uh i have to see what the prices are but it's definitely something we're interested in so yeah, that's mostly been what I've I've been up to, um, along with what I'm going to be talking about today. So, Alexis, how are things in your neck of Europe? Uh, not too much recently, but my boyfriend has been playing uh, for Staven at the moment. I couldn't join, unfortunately. Um, I've heard that it's a lot better than Gloomhaven, but uh, still feels that it, it still has some of the... Um, the things that I, I disliked about Gloomhaven in the first place, uh, but I, I'm willing to, to try it at some point and uh, give it a good go, because that seems very fun. Uh, other than that, uh, not too much. It's mostly been work recently. <laughs> uh, I have to say, uh, we have to see if it's better than Gloomhaven, Joseph the Lion, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but uh, we we can uh, we'll, we'll talk about that I'm sure in details once every uh, yeah. every one of the um, last ND people have been able to to play some of it. I know that uh, yeah, Kara is deep into a campaign at the moment. Yep, I think comparing Frosthaven to Jaws of the Lion is, uh, apart from them both using the same system, <laughs> it's just not going to work. They've they're different products for different players. Um, I think you can compare Frosthaven to Gloomhaven somewhat because uh, you'd expect them to learn and improved on things, but uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, it still feels like Joe of the Lion is going to be like more of my kind of game uh, in the end. Um, in the end. Uh, but right now, uh, we can start talking about uh, Cry Havoc, which is uh, the game that you're uh, bringing today, Alessio, right? Uh, yes! Uh, Cry Havoc is a game from 2016 from Portal Games, the one run by Ignacy Trevisek, so the man behind Robinson Crusoe. And it's a game by Grant Rodiek, which is uh, uh, who is ca- kind of famous, but basically is the man who brought us forth. So we we know he's a capable he's a capable designer. So uh, <laughs> Cryevok is uh, an asymmetric area control game, which is pretty old. Uh, I had it since 2017. It was a birthday gift, and. Uh, uh, I have to say, uh, I wanted to talk about it eventually because it is so good. Uh, basically, in Cryevok, uh, uh, it has just been discovered a new planet, and this planet has a lot of energy cubes scattered around uh, that are wanted by basically every race in the galaxy. Uh, there are the humans which are, of course, your basic space marines. There are the pilgrims, who are uh, kind of uh, techno-religious people wanting to harvest these energy cubes and uh, prosper on a new planet. And there are the machines uh, that, like in all games and in all literature and everywhere else, have decided that uh, living life is overvalued and they want just to kill all humans. Actually, kill all livings. Uh, Besides... Uh, uh, aside with these three factions, there are also the Trogs, which are the indigenous uh, population of the of the planet, and they are just wanting to defend it from the invaders. And uh, these are the four factions you can play in this game. You can play two to four players, uh, but in two to three players you can only control the first three factions, while the uh, Trogs are actually the played by uh, the environment in the in two three player games and they become a playable faction only in a four player games uh, this game has a best player count at three players and it's good at four players uh, it's pretty good also on two players but you miss a bit of the symmetry because the, the main thing of this game is that the faction are uh, completely asymmetrical and ac- actually completely they follow a pretty standard set of rules so don't expect root but it is a very powerfully different asymmetry and it's very very balanced i uh, now um uh, I will probably say a lot of things which will uh, get me eight mails uh, in the coming weeks. So uh, one thing I want to start with is that the balance in this game is so much better than Root. Okay, Root should take example from the balance in this game. Uh, But I'll talk about it. Basically, you have these three factions. You have to. There are. You are on a tabletop, which is a play area, which is basically the planet. The planet has the nice, uh, has the nice ch- characteristic that uh, every uh, square is contiguous, so you don't have the border regions which uh, are not connecting to anything else. But you have border regions who uh, connect to the border region on the other side uh, this planet is already populated with energy cubes and trogs and events and uh, the players have starting areas 
From there you have uh, a deck of cards which are unique and give unique powers to each faction which have in turn their own set of buildings which give them uh, specific abilities and their own set of skills which in the basic games are one basic skill but they can become up to four in an advanced game and you basically play by moving, invading regions, controlling regions and fighting battles. Uh, that's your usual drill for uh, for uh, actually an area control game. Uh, this game has two beautiful things which make it an example today of how design can be good. Uh, the first one is the most beautiful is the how you resolve combat. So uh, combat is always one versus one. Think of uh, uh, the invasions or the infighting in uh, in games like Yellow and Yancey or uh, Tigris and Ophratis. Uh, it's always one versus one and battles are resolved in order. Uh, you can play only with the miniatures you have in the region which is invaded and contested and the combat is resolved entirely without dice. Only with a pretty smart idea which is there is a like a combat card in which you place miniatures. Each combat has three objectives, which are always resolved in order, which is area control. So you need uh, who has the majority of miniatures in area control, they control the region. Then there's capture prisoners, which is resolved usually after death. And uh, who has the, ma the, the, the majority in that area uh, gets to take away miniatures from other areas in the uh, from that combat and the miniatures score VPs and aren't available as reinforcement later to the player until they buy them back and uh, that's the third uh, the, the third objective which is just attrition uh, or killing enemies if you have the majority there, for each unit you have the majority, uh, you can kill off another unit in uh, uh, on that territory. Uh, with this, the combat is beautiful because basically the invader places first, then uh, the defender places. Uh, after that, each player can play a single tactic card, which can influence the combat possibly by resolving stuff in another order or moving your or your opponent's miniatures somewhere. And that is the way the combat is resolved. The combat is extremely epic and tense and it works without rolling any dice. This is really beautiful. Uh, if you haven't ever saw how it works, I, I can't even begin to describe how cool it is, but it works. It's perfect. And that's basically it. The Second really, really cool uh, idea behind the game is that scoring doesn't happen uh, all the turns. It only happens in combat and whenever one player enables scoring. So uh, whenever one player plays a tactic card which allows you to enable scoring, uh, that player for that turn uh, gains one victory point for each region they control, plus every player gets one victory points for each energy cube in a region they control. So everyone goes forward, but the player who played the enable scoring goes forward a bit more. Uh, and the game, the flow of the game changes the more players score, because at set intervals during the point track you will pass across some events which get resolved at the time you pass them. So the board state changes, the game varies because there is a lot of variance and you go on until someone passes the 50 victory points mark. When, they pass, uh, when the first player passes the 50 victory points mark, there is one final turn with enable scoring for the final turn for everyone. And this is basically it. Any one of you play, ever played the Cry Evoque? I did not. Uh, not me either, no. Um, 
you would be hard pushed to get me to play anything other than Nexus Ops or any <laughs> small scale um, skirmish game. Uh, I have the Avalon Hill version and I love it to pieces. Um, <laughs> which they did obviously they're not the same game, uh, and that one sounds a lot less random. Um, but that's what it made me think of while you were talking about it. I was like, mm, I haven't played Nexus Ops in a while. So, <laughs> no, afraid not. I've not even heard of it before now. Yeah, so basically, Cryevok is an experience which is extremely beautiful because it's an area control game where there's basically. Uh, only the randomness the player is comfortable with uh, introducing with their own tactics. It's uh, beautiful because you are basically in control of stuff, but the games, the game has variance because uh, you are moving into territories and when you do, you activate uh, the locals basically and events which are usually beneficial more or less with your powers, with your buildings, you uh, actually change the board state for everyone else, the order won't always be the same, the powers will be completely asymmetric and the game kind of works. Uh, it is pretty beautiful, I, I have to pay it a, a good compliment here saying that I have since uh, Christmas 2017 and since there I think I play it at least uh, uh, once or twice a year even if it's sold. So uh, it's a game which is recurringly good. I, I know that once or twice uh, cannot seem a lot, but trust I mean, me. <laughs> how, how long is a, is a full no, no. game of it? Yeah, th there are some games that you get and you only play every once or twice. On a Ex exactly. Like Twi Twilight Imperium, if you play it once every five years, it's paid off. <laughs> the cost. You, uh, at Game of Thrones, we play once a year. You are, yeah. lo you are logistically not able to play it more than once every six months because that's about the average length of a game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Twilight Imperium. <laughs> so, how long is uh, Cryavok? Uh, Cryavok uh, is usually your first game. Uh, it's two to three hours, but you can play it in two hours comfortably with experienced, play, with experienced players because uh, most of the stuff is checking rules if you are resolving the event correctly or you are checking if you really want to uh, do something instead of something else. For instance, uh, if you are an experienced player, you will probably play with you will probably want to play with pilgrims, which have a lot of effects which combo with each other and with movement. But to do that, uh, you will be a bit AP prone if you uh, are like that. So with experience, it gets better, a lot better. But at the beginning, you will probably be in the two to three hours range. While when experienced, I think you will always play a game in two hours. And uh, uh, to, to, to continue on this, uh, I actually have to say that uh, uh, the game is really good to, to play both with casuals and with, uh, uh, with experienced players. Because it's true that the more skilled player wins, but uh, the trucks are actually a faction uh, very beginner friendly. So since the complexity can vary, uh, the game can put a lot of people on an even playing field. Now, <laughs> I usually don't like to find flaws in Cryavok because I adore Cryavok, but I have to be honest in a couple of things which are basically the flaws of this game. The first one and the most important is that if you have only the base game, there is one expansion which changes this. Uh, if you have only the base game, playing with the trogs against experienced players will eventually uh, lead to you always losing because the trogs have only one uh, one tactic really available against experienced players it, and that tactic is to zerg them <laughs> from the beginning until mid game when they basically will be denied every opportunity to scoring because uh, trogs are really low tech because they are beginner friendly, so they only have numbers. At the beginning, there are a lot of trucks on the planet, and uh, that is a, an important advantage that the opponent must, that, that the uh, truck player must push. 
that's also uh, the reason why I think this game is best at three players because when uh, everyone plays the trucks, when uh, the trucks are always present, so they are always there, but uh, when you don't have four player, the, the role of the trucks is taken by the player to your left, uh, who is absolutely encouraged to destroy you to pieces, so they will always play the trucks with uh, cruelty, and... Uh, Basically, that's the best way to play the base game. Uh, there is an expansion which gives you variable, variable player powers in the beginning because it, it kind of gives you something similar to aspects uh, to your faction so that you uh, can have a special building or a special commander of the faction which changes some rules. And in that case, the trogs have some powers which help it evening the play the playing field but uh, in the base game the trucks are a bit underpowered so uh, it feels against experienced players and this is the first flow the second flow is that oh, well uh, this game helps you know yourself <laughs> There are a lot of people who say, I love uh, war games, <laughs> I love Risk, for instance, and, uh, well, after playing one game of Cry Evoc, you will actually know if you like this kind of games or you like rolling dice, because uh, the experience of someone rushing in and getting utterly devastated on an attack they just half acid, let's say, uh, it's absolute. They will be absolutely frustrated. I, I, I have a dear friend who, who plays a lot of competitive games, but was absolutely devastated by Cry Evoc because it wasn't expecting that kind of competition, that kind of Euro-like competition on our game. And, and that's it. Basically, uh, all, I, all I, I can think of is to compare this to Root, which is another game I love and adore, but I have to say, in Root, uh, luck plays a major factor, especially among experienced players. Uh, if all players are experienced, if all players at the table of Root have agreed upon a good board setup, especially with advanced setup, uh, basically the outcome will almost never come from a very very smart play i think i think the very very smart plays are against the people who don't expect that those uh, in root you will always win for a small swing of luck at some point in cryevoc this never happens and that's basically it. That's all I love and like about Cry Evoc, and that's why I keep playing it. <laughs> that sounds very interesting. Uh, I've never heard of the game before, so unfortunately, I'm not able to to say too much. Yeah, it. but the, it the, sounds the, it sounds like a like a kind of a hidden gem. Yeah, the the, the crazy thing is that this game is. Uh, reasonably old it was I, I think it was discussed because i learned about it in a dice tower review back then so uh, but there's something uh, i think in the graphics chosen for the game which is a bit like it remembers halo a lot uh, or in the fact that it's basically a game from uh, uh, grant rodiak who, who was uh, uh, who became famous later basically <laughs> Uh, I don't know why, but it happened. So it's, it's yeah, it's currently 750 something in the Board Game Geek uh, global uh, ranking. So it's pretty good actually for a game this old. And that's it, Cry well, Evoc. Try, I, try it and tell me. <laughs> I might have to, to have a look at it. Um, Fen, is there anything that you wanted to, uh, to add about Cry Avoc? No, no, so I haven't played it, and uh, I can say this isn't the kind of game that we get much play here, uh, unfortunately. It sounds interesting, but um, 
uh, we, we've uh, we've already got our fill of um, conflict style games. Yeah, you've been known to be uh, a lot more about games about one big opponent facing uh, four small ones into uh, a larger <laughs> board game in a tactical way, uh, as in uh, the board game adaptation of Monster Hunter World, uh, which yeah. is the topic that you're bringing today. Uh, Indeed, I am. So this is a uh 2022 kickstarter that managed to get everything out uh just very recently uh, it is a one to four player cooperative arena combat boss battler uh, based on monster hunter world the video game um and released by steamforged games uh I would like to point out that Steamforge games have a bit of a rocky past with their games. Um, uh, probably the best of their previous releases and what I'm going to be comparing to uh, would be God Tier and I think the Resident Evil 2 games have been pretty well received. So they're very good at capturing IPs. Uh, I don't know what deals they offer. Uh, people like Capcom, but they certainly seem to be able to get things in. They've got um, the Elden Ring board game, um, either just about finished or finished. So uh, for me, at least, um, this one was make or break. So how do you play the game? Well, you'll get one of or both of the core boxes. These represent two of the five locales within Monster Hunter World. They are the Ancient Forest or the Wild Spire Wastes. Each box will come with four hunters, uh, five monsters, although technically four miniatures, and I'll get into that. Uh, and you will either play this as a like one-off arena battle with preset loadouts. Can you manage to defeat the monster in the arena? In the arena, which is an element of Monster Hunter World, you do have to um, do arena battles for some progress within the video game. Um, or you can play a campaign where you go to like play through the grind of constructing yourself a loadout with the goal of taking out a certain high level monster. Within the core games, you will either be looking to take out a four star tempered Rathalos, either I think Azure or you can do the normal Rathalos. I'm not 100% on that. I think it may have to be the Azure. Um, I did the Azure when I played. Uh, or um, a Diablos or a Black Diablos. So essentially it's a storyless campaign that you're trying to push your way through and defeat a big bad monster. Um, you can even, with some of the expansions, make the final end goal a Elder Dragon. And there are three available and I'll talk about those a little bit later on. Setup's actually pretty straightforward for a campaign. Uh, you will pick um, a hunter. Uh, you also have a minimum of two hunters. Uh, you can have up to four. Um, I find possibly thinking about trying to play four hunters solo Ooh. being a bit overwhelming. Yeah, no. Like, yeah, we'll we'll get into we'll get into how the hunters play very shortly. And essentially, you'll pick a weapon type for them, and they will stick with that weapon type throughout the whole campaign. Um, unlike the video game where you can chop and change, but to be brutally honest. Um, the, I think it's better that you're sticking with one weapon. It helps you keep you keep focused, but it does mean you sort of want to try out the weapons before you commit because you might start a campaign and be like, oh, I do not like how this particular weapon plays. And they do all play very differently. Uh, from there, you will essentially go out on a series of hunts. It's kind of open to how you choose to do it. You can challenge the final boss when you feel like it, really, as long as you feel strong enough, but you have a finite number of days. Standard campaign for one of the core boxes is 25 days, so that is at a maximum 25 hunts to get there, but you have downtime stuff that you could be doing, and that does cost days as well. So you want to think about, if you're going to be playing this as a campaign, it's probably going to take a few months if you're playing once a week to get through. It's not going to take half a year, like some boss battlers can, um, but it's still a moderately lengthy experience. Uh, each hunt, each monster is sort of hunted separately. Uh, you'll initially begin with an assigned quest, which is like a nice 
gentle version of the monster to just to start to get to grips with how it's acting. Um, it will have less hit points, it'll have less powerful version of its static ability that each monster has. Uh, and then once you've beaten that, you can't fight it again. So you can fight it multiple times and fail, uh, and that actually doesn't cost time on the campaign. But once you've done that, you're on to the investigations, and you've got four of those you can do before the monster starts becoming tempered. There's an option to refight those, but it costs even more time. So it, it's got a nice like bit of balance between trying to get through a monster in a reasonable amount of time um, and get the materials you need for whatever you want to make, while also um, sort of scaling things up and changing things each time. A hunt starts with an investigation phase. Uh, this is a choose your own adventure. Uh, I think it's probably the weakest part of the game. It's fine. It really is fine. Um, I wish they'd done this in a map version. I would have much preferred putting a map out of the ancient forest and having like tokens randomly um, dealt first down to all the different places where the monsters typically hang, hang out on the map. And then you, you like make your way there and gather stuff along the way, maybe have the little encounters and things before arriving at a particular arena, flipping it up and going, oh, it's not here. Okay, next one. And even splitting up if you wanted to and stuff. It'd be kind of interesting. Ultimately, this section is fine. You read a little description, you spend a little bit of time. I'll talk about time when we get to talking about the hunt. And then you may gain some resources or you might get damaged or other kind of things and you may and you make choices. These choices sometimes will add cards to the time deck. So quite often they'll take them away. And there's also how you're going to get your hands on a lot of the generic non monster specific resources that you need for normal weapon lines or and so on. Um, that, that's actually uh, w one question that I quickly wanted to, to go for if, mm -hmm. <laughs> if it's not an issue. Uh, since you played a, a lot more than, than I did. Um, yep. In the, the short little try that I did yesterday, um, that seemed to be a bit long. Like it's longer than other games that have this sort of uh, hunt face, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it felt like maybe a little bit too long, especially since there was not too much to do beside reading the text and, and just going through the motion. Um, I'm kind of wondering how, how that feels over an entire campaign. Like, did you did you ever get tired or bored of it, or is it just fine? Essentially, the first time I played through, we did look at the text and read that, but because they've bolded all of the actual action text, once we kind of seen everything, we went straight in with make the decisions, do the mechanics onto the next piece. Yeah, and makes sense. I'll be honest. That felt like playing the video game as yeah. well, because the you know, first time you wander, you explore a location, you take your time, you run into lots of different things, and you marvel at it. And then when you get experience with the game, you're just like, down to business, where is it? Let's get it. That's, that's going to go. be a bit of a team uh, later on, because that's something that I will bring. That There's a, a lot of little quirks of the board game that are get a little bit on the way, but on the, the exact same way that it does into the... Um, the yeah, <laughs> game, which I, I find quite funny. Uh. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, once you found the monster, uh, you will deploy on a board. Uh, the boards has two boards, one in each of the core games. They have double sides. It's just purely cosmetic. There will be terrain. Some of the worst terrain I've ever seen. They are round discs with a big symbol on them, and they're coloured and they come in three types: pond water body rock and bush um the mechanically they're interesting but uh it, this is definitely a bit of the game where i felt aesthetically there's no reason for them with these dull round objects they could have been varied in shape um for sure uh as long as they didn't get too large so the monsters might but yeah one of the things that does happen with these discs is occasionally a monster drags the disc around with it because you forget it's on top of a piece of terrain because it fits perfectly over it and you lift it up eventually to do something. You're like, oh yes, Oop, that bush has moved. Oops. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I, I would have preferred if they'd done like f two boards per box with four different sides and had four specific terrain setups because each fight has a specific terrain loadout. And it has certain um, bushes and things in the same place, even at the higher level ones. Uh, so they could have done more here. Um, but the board itself is a node-based movement system, which I was apprehensive about at first. Um, 
Although, let's be honest, nodes are just fancy circular squares. So, <laughs> really shouldn't be too concerned. Circular it's squares. The, it's circular squares. Yeah, the circled square. There's some wrestling for you. I don't know <laughs> much more wrestling except about The Undertaker. Uh, yeah. Now, nodes can have like a whole bunch of hunters on the space, but the monster just doesn't share. The monster will push them out of the way if it moves into the space that they're in. Um, with two hunters, that means you rarely have a bunch up in the same spot, and it does affect some attacks from the monster, because uh, sometimes they have AoE splashes that hit like everyone on a certain node. Um, but with more hunters, you, you do start crowding into the same spots at times, and you have to think about, okay, should we be all together like this? Um, uh, especially given that we're gonna well, we get to arcs. So I'm gonna start with the monster, and the reason for that is the monsters dictate the pace of the fight. The time deck dictates how long you've got, but the monster basically tells you uh, how many hunters are gonna get to have a go and how many cards they're gonna be allowed to play. And I think this is the first of the really good mechanics is this monster deck. Um, it is a set of mini euro size cards i hate the size of them okay they, they look fantastic they're gorgeous but they they're just too small like there's no reason for them to be that size uh, at all i think legibility could be improved a bit if they'd scaled it up um so that is a negative but that's my only complaint about the cards um because not only are they clear to follow they have a clear readability they are also innovative so first of all when you draw the card you will have an ind a symbol on the left hand side that tells you if they're targeting the nearest or furthest away hunter um, and then in the case that the hunters are at the same distance you've got threat tokens that each hunter has and there are a number and those will break ties so you you, you like you're very clear on who it's going to be targeting and you can also hide in bushes to reduce your threat which is a nice mechanic. Then you will have like the moves the monster is going to do and this order can change but effectively it will be attacking then moving or moving then attacking. Uh, it will do its full movement when it's moving so often like you, it rolls into a hunter and then the hunter has to like step backwards and it will do it again and again. This creates a whole section of the game where you're trying to kite the monster correctly to a place where its attack isn't going to hit everyone um, because you don't really want to let it smack all the players if you can avoid it um, and then it will do its attack now when it does its attack first that's like often a breather because if you're not in the areas it's hitting it's just a missed attack which is nice uh, to experience um, but the other way around it's definitely going to be hitting then you've got what range it hits at, so the number of nodes you count away from the monster and it'll hit that. Whether it's hitting like a single target or whether it's hitting an arc, and every monster has four arcs, front, left and right, so they're just sides and then back. And it'll tell you what arcs it's hitting on, so like it might do a big tail sweep that hits a left, back and right arc. Or it might be really focused on just hitting what's in front of it, and this will vary. Um, you'll also be told what the dodge value is. This is how many agility points you have to spend to avoid a hit. I'll talk about that with the hunters. Um, and then how much damage it is going to deal. And then, like, if it's elemental damage, it'll have some uh, indicators. Otherwise, it's just sort of physical damage. Um, but I have buried the lead on this one because the really good part of these cars, like the amazing part of them, is the backsides, which have printed on them not just the monster's uh, crest iconography, but they also have on the left hand side a symbol that tells you what body part the monster's going to be using, and on the right hand side whether it's going to target the nearest or furthest away. So even when it's sat on top of the deck, you've got some info. And that ties back into Monster Hunter, where Monster Hunter follows the same format as FromSoft games, in that they are teaching you and testing you on your ability to react to things. So Monster Hunter, the monster will signal, and it'll do a certain animation, and that is telling you what attack it's going to do, and you need to be ready to avoid that attack and then punish. So this is doing that, and I'm just going to say it now, 
If you're doing a boss battler and you're not printing some information like this on the back of your deck, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Okay? This is amazing. So that is my opinion on the monster behavior deck. How did you guys find it? I found it amazing. Uh, as a big Monster Hunter f uh, fan, which is something I'll, I'll go over in a, in, in a bit once, uh, once I talk more about my impression, but I thought that the, the back of the deck was really interesting, especially since it, it highlights which body part of the monster is going to be used for the attack. So you can sort of estimate which angle the monster is going to attack from. It's not always easy to, to avoid them because the monster is going to move and stuff, but still uh, it gives you so much information just even just the the targeting of the monster like it's either going to be uh the closest person or the furthest away uh the card the targeting is quite easy in the game which is uh pretty nice i feel uh especially without crunchy the rest of the game is um it, it gives you so much information it allows you to think uh a little bit in advance like oh i should probably uh raise my shield and and prepare myself for a hit since i'm the furthest away person and i i can tank the next hit uh, something like that uh that's really good it reminded me a little bit of ato that does something kind of similar but i think that monster Hunter world uh, does it better um really yeah, yeah. massive props for that one yeah, ATO has like one card that's different on the back, plus the different levels of cards. So you know if it's going to be a big hitting uh, move or if it's going to be yeah. like, this is the super dangerous move, but you don't get the level of texture you do with this. Uh, Alessio, how did you feel about this? Uh, well, uh, first, uh, first, first thought is that it's actually brilliant. So uh, it's obviously... Uh, so smart and so simple to implement which is uh i don't know if there's the, the, the this way or this figure of speech in other languages but the the, the egg of columbus <laughs> <laughs> or uh, how you say something which is uh, obviously it's wonderful once you saw that first so uh it's smart, it's brilliant. Of course, I'm not surprised because uh, it was teased in the Kickstarter campaign one year ago. So we already prepared for that and it was smart. And it, uh, it's it, having, uh, I play my boss battlers uh, always with raw eyed headband, quantum eye or, or anything which works like that. Uh, so having it embedded in the game and actually having to take that into account when you strategize uh, is uh, basically heaven for me. So yeah, that's smart. I, I actually wanted to talk uh, about the no the no terrain too, but uh, we, we we can save it for final discussions eventually. <laughs> yeah, I I'll just add one quick thing before we move on. Uh, I always think that with any game uh, having giving more information to the player and uh, giving them more uh, ability to react rather than um, rather than simply uh, submit to whatever the, the random is going to is, is going to do uh, is always good. Uh, this is why Slay the Spire is such an amazing game uh, for so many people because the monster announce before what they before their turn what they are going to do and allow the player to prepare and feel like they're reacting tactically instead of just uh handling the the consequence of whatever random throws at them so in here uh, i think that monster Hunter World just does it marvelously yeah now for um listeners uh, before i get on to how the card dictates what the player turns are like i'm just going to give you one example from old nerdy g nerdy g mm -hmm. aka nergigante so nergigante famously has a move that it gradually builds up to like many elder dragons have like some big moment where it flies up in the air and dives down now typically most hunters first experience of this when it happens is they get carted <laughs> get dumpstered it is yeah so it's a big big moment but when you know what's coming you understand how it's going to happen and how to deal with it so when fighting nergigante uh this card sits on the side of the board the whole time and gradually nergigante will gain spikes and you can break off some of these spikes to lower the speed at which it's going to do this but eventually the spikes will hit a certain level it's going to do this dive for its next action and um, then it's going to like all the spikes are going to bust off. 
So this is a furthest hunter away. Nergigante moves four, meaning it reaches anywhere on the arena. Um, it has a range of two, so anyone within two nodes of Nergigante is going to be hit. Um, it, deal, it, it requires six agility to dodge, which is Oof. a huge number in this game, yeah. Um, and it deals 12 damage to the front and back arcs of it. Yeah, that's an so, immediate cut. Yeah. Yeah, that is basically an immediate carting, with the exception of certain um, certain weapons can set up a lot, enough block to tank it. But if you don't have them around, what this results in is you're looking at this and you're seeing the spines build up and you're like, OK, this is going to happen. Somebody needs to move furthest away who's got enough stamina available to get that dodge in. Because otherwise somebody is going and we've only got two feints before the third one is fight over. And I think that's such a great example because it's there. It's in front. You can mitigate it. But if you're not paying attention, you're going to get carted. And I think that like sums it up wonderfully. Um, in regards to the monster's behaviours, there are ten fixed cards. And then there are three which are vary and they're randomised in. Um, that might not sound like a lot that you've got ten things all the same. And then you've got like one different um, but it turns out that because of the hunter turns, having repetition from the monsters not only matches the video game, but it also it's really essential. Um, I have fought the Great Jagras eight times. By the time I'd fought the White Lion for my eighth time, I was feeling like, OK, I know what this is doing. I know what I need to do. Um, I know when it's going to get out of control and I need to sort of take things under you know, reset and try and level out the fight. Um, that's the white line from Kingdom Death for anyone who's not familiar. Uh, Bog Basic, it's the equivalent of the Great Jagras in this. I'm at eight battles against Great Jagras um, at various different difficulty levels. I don't feel like I've got a handle on exactly how to approach it. I am still reacting and dealing with it blow after blow. Um, and the the tempered Great Jagras is is uh, another thing coming that, as well. That, that is something that I, I will uh, also slightly point out, is that in the video game, the Great Jagras is basically a joke. Uh, it, it rolls around and has tons of opening. It's a very... Uh, this is the easy monster to, to start with. The Great Jagras in the, the board game, if you, you cannot tank more than one hit. It, it, will, it will fuck you up. Like When I looked at the damage that it did for the first time, I, I had to look twice and I had to look around to make sure that I was doing the health properly because it seemed ludicrous that the Jag uh, Great Jagras first attack was able to put my hunter into 1 HP. <laughs> um, yeah, it is, yeah, it is a beast. Um, but that, I think, is really good. So with that, we'll get on to how the monster allows players to have a go. So on the far right, after you've walked from left to right across everything on the monster behavior card, you'll find a blue symbol with a number on it that tells you how many hunters get to have a go before the next monster behavior card is drawn. And below that, how many uh, cards from their weapon they're allowed to play onto their stamina board. Uh, you'll see numbers usually between one and three for the number of cards they're allowed to play. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about the hunter board, shall we? Because this was a surprise uh, for definite. So at the start of the game, you will pick your we chosen weapon type, and you will get a set of armor which is either leather or chainmail. They both only have one armor point, so that soaks one point of damage. And where they, um, the only difference between them is that Chainmail has it on the legs and Leather has it on the body. That does impact on how you're upgrading, because you'll upgrade the armored piece last of all most of the time. But the real heart of what you're getting is your weapon. So your weapon comes with a deck of cards. I've got the charge blade here. That's got 20 cards in its starting deck. Um, and there are, like, some of them are um, duplicates. Uh, you'll get, like, up to three or four of some, and others will have just, like, one card. Um, and then you'll have listing of damage. So every weapon has a damage deck. Uh, I'm going to talk about that quickly because it's the less complicated bit. Um, essentially, it's a number of cards that are shuffled together in a deck that uh, they either deal one, two, anything up to five damage is what these cards are at, and they'll be in different numbers. For example, the Switch Axe has um, one, 
four, and the rest are all ones. Whereas the Proto Commission Axe for the Charge Blade has eight ones and two, uh, two fours. No, sorry, four twos. Uh, four twos. So that is um, a very different kind of way that the deck works. And the only way you refresh this deck and get it get it shuffled back from the discard pile is by taking a preparation turn, which is your hunter going and you get a chance to drink a potion if you want to. That will reset your health and stamina. Um, you can still move around, uh, but you can't attack. And it will let you do a sharpen, which is just reshuffling your deck. And in the case of some things like the gun lance, that's where you reset that, your shells. That's also. that's the most master hunter thing uh, that there is that there is in the game. <laughs> yeah, it's not just that; it's also really interesting because you are constantly looking at your damage deck. And like the switch axe is really good to teach you about how you don't run the deck out because that starting switch axe has one four and a load of ones. And once that four is gone, you, you need to be looking for an opportunity to sharpen. I did the, I did the switch axe versus the Baroth. The Baroth has, um, it loves to headbutt you. It has one armor on its head. So that meant I was constantly having to reposition with the switch axe because I couldn't get through the armor on its head to hurt it. I could hit it on the flanks and the back, but going head on with the switch axe, the basic style switch axe, was no, forget about it. Um, so yeah, I I love how it introduces card counting and how you're thinking about how much average damage can I put out? How When do I need to sharpen? Oh, all of my good cards have gone. I've just got ones left. Uh, but you're going to say something, Alexis. It, uh, Alexi. Yes, it is also really interesting to do the reverse because I was playing Switch Axe 2 because it's my uh, one of my main weapons in the, the actual video game. Um, if you only pulled up your one, you can decide to, uh, even though you're already damaged and maybe you need to take a potion, you can think, well, I know that one of the, 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 the four cards that, that is left there is my four. So I can do one more hit before I heal so that I can, before I heal and, and sharpen so that I can pull off that four uh, in the monster space. And you, you start thinking like, exactly, as you said, card counting and, and like thinking tactically about the game. It's brilliant in that way. Yeah, it's a masterclass in what we call derived information, which is where it's all on the board and you can see it and you can understand it. For example, the monster's health, that's derived information. You know what it started with, you know what health it is on. Um, and likewise, you know what cards you've been through in the deck. And it's the same with a monster deck. You can, when you get experienced, you should know what just about every single move the monster's going to be pulling is from the back of the card before it happens. Because especially the monsters that use multiple different body parts to attack, there's a, there's a difference. And even when, say, if the monster does a lot of furthest target with head attacks, like the Jagras, that's a Jagras going to be spitting most of the time. Um, you can look at the discard pile and think of the moves that's already been done and work out what's going to be happening. And this is what makes for a good boss battler, is having an area where you can grow in skill and... This damage deck is a good example of that, and the monster deck as well is. But then we have the attack decks. So, uh, every attack card in your deck um, follows roughly the same format. You have in the top left corner a symbol um, with, with your um, weapon type in it. All the starting deck ones have a hexagonal symbol. Any ones that are added by upgraded weapons, we'll talk about it, um, have a square box and they'll have colored weapons as well so very easy to identify them then you have the name of the attack because every attack in monster hunter has a name and you'll get very familiar with them even if you weren't from playing um, then then sometimes there's an optional symbol that certain weapons use for example the hammer has a hammer symbol located there and certain other cards will trigger off that symbol the charge blade has potion vials white ones that gradually build up and then when you play a blue one it'll trigger off the white ones and do some extra damage um, then underneath that is the stamina bar some cards don't have a stamina bar you can just discard them to do things. They're fantastic. They're really useful. They involve stuff like removing other cards from your stamina bar, which we're going to discuss for sure. Uh, or like in the case of the gun lance, they let you reload some of your shells. And then the top right corner has the agility. So we talked about this briefly with the um, section about the monsters and how you need to play cards for agility to dodge. This is where uh, that comes into play. You've got to put cards face down on your stamina track 
equal to the number or higher than the number that is shown as the dodge value from the monster. So most of these cards, there's a few that do three, but most of them are like zero, ones and twos. And that gives you another idea of how terrifying that Nergigante dive is. It's a six to avoid. Most hunters are going to need three to four cards to succeed at that, which is which is tough. Um, it also has symbology on it that tells you whether you're allowed to to move before or after, and whether sometimes if you can move anywhere or if you have to move towards the monster or if you move away from it. Um, it has a exploded symbol that tells you how many damage cards you're going to draw. Um, and then the bar itself matters. If it's a yellow bar, it means uh, if you've got options to play more cards, you can play more. If it has a little red arrow at the end, it's telling you, okay, that is the end of your turn. Once you play this card, it's an exciting finishing move, but that's it, you're done. Um, bottom left corner has range, tells you how many nodes away you, you can be when you use this card. Uh, then in the middle is breaks. Um, that is a gradually building up token system that eventually breaks monsters' um, pieces, parts on their body. Um, and once you've successfully broken a part, you will get a bonus during a fight sometimes. And then at the end, you'll get to um, more resources. So breaks are good. Breaks are exciting. Breaks are terrifying against the investigation Great Jagras as it gets more dangerous once you break apart. So you have a really exciting tension where you're trying to get the break break numbers up a bit but not smash anything yet because it's too healthy and it's going to suddenly increase its damage and dodge values by one and just start slapping you stupid and then in the final bottom right corner is the combo number you can only play a card if there are a number of cards on the track already previously face up attack cards um, equal to the number you're looking at combos can be one two there's even a few that are combo number three which means you're gonna have to put a ton of attacks on the board and more or less be playing this one last that's really fun but what makes this tough is the cards only leave the board normally one at a time from the rightmost one at the end of the turn. So woohoo if you filled up your entire bar with five cards you can't play anymore you can't dodge you can't attack that's it you're sitting there um, and so you've got to be very careful with managing your turns where you're doing stuff and then your turns where you're taking time off to just let your stamina regen which is just like the game so um how do you guys find this whole hunter board well <laughs> um the hunter board is um it's a bit crunchy as you you've mentioned uh, a couple of time and every weapon is very different and it takes a long time to learn about it and it can be a bit cumbersome to to get into the proper uh, flow of a weapon which is exactly like the game uh, every weapon in the game every one of the 14 different weapons that you can play in monster hunter has a very different uh, way that you're going to to use it and approach it and it will take uh, hours and hours of playing with it until you can feel very confident in what you can pull off with it. And what's extremely fun is that um, when I played the game, I realized that some of the tactics and some of the combos that work in the game, in the video game, work in the board game. And the crunchiness of it uh, makes a lot of sense. And I thought that was actually pretty brilliant in that uh, in that end. Uh, I really like the uh, active passive turn mechanic, the fact that you can uh, hang back and, and shop on your weapon. Uh, it's just, uh, it was just, I was just a bit uh, disappointed that uh, the stamina is so slow to regenerate. I, I, it makes sense in the term of the, um, uh, the balance of the game and, and you don't want players to be able to pull off uh, crazy combos, but there, there was just... Um, that that's just the the part that I felt like when when you when you take a turn to sharpen maybe it should um, uh, clear up another card of your stamina bar or something. But other than that, I thought that it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, really, really like that. 
Yeah, I, I have um, I, I have had the thought cross as well whether you should, on a preparation turn, be allowed to cool down one further. Uh, I would like to point out, first of all, the great Jagras body piece lets you do a combat and a preparation turn at once. So you get to chug a potion, uh, clear your stamina, and smack the monster, which is really fun. Um, but also, uh, some of the weapons are way better at um, stamina management. Like the hammer has um, uh, like a... a I think it's meat steak or, or meat something and you eat it and at the end of your turn you get to just discard two cards off your stamina bar so yeah 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 so there's a, a lot of variation um in in that I, like I, I played with weapons that weapons. are stamina uh, inefficient in the game already so yep yeah um the lance has another like another interesting clearing move where there's certain cards that have a lance pictured on it and once you play your third one you can optionally discard all of them from your stamina track so it's very um leans into depending what weapon you're using um on that front but anyway alessio what were your thoughts uh, well actually the the tempo management of this game is the thing i actually find most interesting overall actually uh the best thing uh let, let's organize my thoughts so uh, there's a lot of good things to say because this game is uh, constellated of a lot of small very smart things okay so uh, there are a lot of beautiful touches uh, here and there uh, the way game tempo is managed starting from the fact that at the end of the monster ai you know how many uh, hunters can act is beautiful because everything combines together and you have a lot to plan i i uh, I, I think i suspect that my my single play of the great jagra uh, i played with one hunter with dual blades and another hunter with a bow i think i was uh, uh, i was kind of trying our mod hard mod because I, I had not a lot of breaks i had not a lot of high damage but in the meantime i was filling up stamina continuously because well actually dual blades are very good at dodging so you put them put their one card and you are usually okay and you move a lot with attacks with dual blades but you are attacking a lot and chinching a lot so uh, i found this beautiful because uh, it's true you said okay it's my turn in your turn you discover that you have uh, a limited option to uh, to decide from and what you decide is act does actually matter a lot although the reactive behavior is not exactly the best uh, the best thing I I love to play I like to play it's beautiful in this game and uh, uh, to finish it the, ta the the time cards are simply smart they uh, they do a lot to convey what happens in a hunting master hunter and uh, it's smart the way you usually remove one card from the track with the time card the it's smart the way you decide okay i will play just two cards so i can have another turn because with this hunter be before its turn of the great jagra and, Ka and the capra pair or i decide to prepare so i will not add cards and we'll see what happens with the ten card but then you draw the ten card and you understand that you are low on time so you need uh, to attack fast uh, everything comes together and uh, I have to say, uh, given the track record of Steam Forged games, some very good game and some very terrible game, I would have settled for less. But this game is, I, I, I think, a new standard for this because it's so smart in a lot of things. Yeah. I, the, the one thing that I will um, mention, though, is that uh, while I really like the, the crunchiness of the, the player board, I thought that the monster, uh, the monster turn, the monster count was a bit overloaded in information. And once you, you understand what every icon means, uh, it starts to make sense. But I was still checking the manual from time to time to understand. And I, I, I felt like there was maybe a bit of a streamlining that, that could happen in the way that the monster is handled, while the the, the 
player should be crunchy. I think that the monster was a. Uh, sometimes I, I had to check what the monster would actually do, and uh, I had sometimes trouble with figuring out what uh, left on the node meant and how it should turn. And some of the movement just didn't felt as uh, as logical as they should. But uh, the player turn was obviously uh, really really well handled. Yeah, it's it's got a definite um, symbology learning. A curve to it uh, i'd say like race for the galaxy where it's it, you do spend a lot of time early on reading and going what's this symbol mean again what does this one mean but i did find like i i've played um over 20 battles over the last like week or so uh 20 hunts and um it did become fairly intuitive what was going on and i, I appreciated how the monster moved once i clicked with what it's doing um, so that was very good, but uh, I will say first of all, um, there is no status effect reference card in this game, um, and the status effects you use the same symbols for yourself and the monster. Cool, great. That's uh, that's like Monster Hunter. They do different things. Yeah, all that, yeah. All that was needed was just a a, a a four standard like you know standard size reference card or a reference sheet that you could just have out there. I know it's very easy to make one. We're going to see one made by someone in the community if I don't make it myself. Um, it probably does already exist at this point. Uh, that was annoying. Um, there's not actually enough status tokens in one of the two core boxes because sometimes you will like one of the palicos um, that you can, as you play one or two players, you get palicos, which is like a little extra bonus. Um, but one of the palicos can like put a status token on a character's weapon a hunter's weapon and then they are uh, like um, not affected by that status for the rest of the fight uh, so there's just not quite enough tokens i didn't even get into talking about status effects they're pretty interesting and elemental attacks are interesting so uh, they both work in the same way in that when you have a weapon that does the th given thing to the monster you'll take a relevant token of a type and you'll put it on the monster uh, if it's a status effect, you'll look at their resistances, and a certain number of tokens is when it will occur. Like, uh, the Jagras is stunned when it takes one stun token, and then a stun means the next dodge you do against it, you only need dodge one, which is a lifesaver. Uh, but the Toby Kodachi takes two to stun it. Um, so it's twice as hard to do it, and that is actually a lot more effort to get that second token on there because you need to recycle. You don't have a lot of cards that will deal stuns, and Nergagante is immune to stuns, so then that goes out the window. Elemental damage is also really interesting. You'll have another section that lists resistances. Same thing, you'll attack with a weapon that deals elemental damage. As long as you hit, you don't have damage, as long as you hit, you'll put a relevant token on it. Once you get the number equal to the threshold for the monster, you'll draw a card from the elemental damage deck, and that will just flat do an X amount of wound damage to the monster. So that's where you are rewarded for looking at monster resistances and taking the appropriate weapon. Don't go smacking a Rathalos with a fire weapon. They are resistant to fire, or I think they're immune, actually. They're um, immune, any, probably. Yeah, yeah, probably immune. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, that, That's like a really interesting bit as well. Uh, all I have left to talk about, then, is... Um, yeah, you mentioned a bit on the time cards. Uh, I think there is a issue with the time cards in that there's four time cards that just eat into monster time immensely and another two that heal it slightly um and i've had hunts where i've gone raw into raw with six cards a piece and that's just a that's that's done that's over that's 12 turns lost you typically have 30 turns 35 turns somewhere depending on the monster sometimes 25 uh, and you've got to you also lose time cards during the investigation period Sometimes you gain one or two, uh, and I feel like that number of those being in the base deck is not fun. I think one raw would be enough, and maybe one of the time-wasting cards, and maybe two of the heals. You can adjust the deck if you own both core sets. Alexis? The random aspect of the time card is something that I didn't thought was super interesting. I, I, I liked the idea, and like I liked what he tried to convene. I really like the fact that you can be... Uh, uh, stunned by a vest for it because that's a reminiscent of the game but i didn't thought that added anything to the game specifically and it just adds a layer of random to the fight where the f entire sort of mechanical um, design of the fight is to be extremely uh, willful that that every action that you take is uh, thought of and there's like a tactical 
uh, knowledge that you you get as you as you fight and as you learn the game but the time deck is just random and you cannot control it and i thought that was a yeah. little bit um just didn't feel like it belonged with the rest yeah i i agree i think the time deck and the time deck having effects is fine i think that some of them are a little bit too much i actually think like you gave the example of the vespoid attack i think that one's perfectly oh, yeah, it's, fine it's, and balanced it's great. you discard down to two cards in hand it's a really tense moment where you're like okay i've got uh okay i'm gonna keep some cards for dodging maybe one i can attack with i will use this as a window maybe to control my stamina a bit uh, and let that cool down um but then there's some of the others like uh a crazy i think another good one is the boulder the boulder deals five damage to the monster or two damage to your hunter but i feel like you're flipping a coin on it the damage values are right but the fact that it's 50 50 feels really off and i think i'd have liked the maybe the trap to have been a terrain piece instead that you interact with in some way so i do think that it's one of the areas i have of criticism um, anyway, as I was say, uh, once you beat the monster, you get a load of resources, you go back to HQ and you craft new weapons uh, and armor. New armor can give you extra like armor points. Sometimes it gives you elemental damage points, so you can actually resist elemental damage attacks like the Jagras Spit or Andras Fire. Uh, and the upgraded weapons will give you a new damage deck with usually better damage cards in them. And it will change a few of the cards in your deck. You'll be told, swap these cards out and put these cards in. And those cards almost always improve or change things a bit. There's quite a lot of variation. Some of them even just tell you, hey, take two cards of your choice out and then put these in. So you even some weapon types, you get a bit of flexibility in what you're doing. It'll lean into whatever the weapon is trying to do. Um, the damage changes as well feel really impactful. Uh, like um, for the charge blade, just going up to the green tier um, with the Diablos wall uh, gives you um, one, one, seven twos, one three, and one four compared to the very basic eight and four split of ones and twos in the basic weapon. So that's like, it, you really feel it. The first time I fought a Toby Kibidachi, I pushed it a little bit and I went in with one upgraded gun lance and the other character didn't have an upgraded weapon. They just had upgraded armor. And when the fight was going on, I was like, oh my gosh, how the heck am I going to win this? Like, I was really feeling time slip away from me. Um, and the Toby Kibidachi is really mobile as well. Like, it will hop off elsewhere and you've got to think about that um but because of the extra damage from the jagras um gun blade i just switched to pure aggression with the gun lance and spending the shells and i managed to get through it my first try but it was really tense and it was genuinely very exciting um and yeah that is pretty much the loops i think uh one of the interesting things to note is that uh, it tracks players turns by you have the, your threat token you flip it face down when um, you finish your go um, and you can't go again until it flips face up and it flips face up when all players are face down so that does create a wheel situation which is pretty cool where one hunter can go and they're the last hunter to go and then they can go first out of the hunters again so they get to go twice in a row really interesting and like an opportunity worth looking out for uh, which is very if cool. if you remember to keep stamina cards for that <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, that's that's the trick. That's why I really like this. Is there's a skill involved in playing the cards? Sometimes it's right to just play one card, or perhaps even to not play any cards, even though you're already prepared in a previous turn. You're just like, there's too much stamina. I know it's going to do a big move. I need to be smart about this. Um, yeah. So before we get onto final thoughts, I've got a number of. It's a list. It's a list of. Uh, of issues so there are multiple errors on the cards crafting costs on the hunter armory are bonkers they're like we're talking seven eight resources when they're meant to be like three um this is all being addressed with the replacement pack that's going to be shipped out to the backers it should be fixed by retail release um i don't think it's a big concern because it's going to be sorted but it is something to pay attention to because they are launching another kickstarter for monster hunter world and we need them to be better on quality assurance than this as i said there's not enough status tokens there's also no tokens for tracking potions you get like between one and three potions for a group uh the the mod that you guys played with gives us potion tokens they look great you don't get them in the physical format 
There's no tokens for tracking feints either. Sure, you can only feint three times. Um, a third feint is game over, but having tokens to track that would help because you are so lost in the source on your turns of thinking about what you need to be doing with your weapon and how to coordinate with others. And when so you're like, oh my God, I I'm going to get fainted if it attacks me. I need you to, I need you to deal with this. That is, um, yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah. That is unfortunate. Yep. I'll to keep yep. track of uh, too. Yeah, um, the hunter threat tokens have very poor contrast in my opinion. Uh, again, it's better on the mod you guys played, but it physically it can be hard to tell whether face up or face down. And overall, like there are saturation, contrast, and color blindness issues with the game. Although the iconography is excellent. Like, I love the, they adapted the symbols across from the game and they've done a really good job with them. And I like how it looks. I don't like how the weapon art looks, but that is an artifact of Monster Hunter World. Yeah, and that's that's something that I wanted to point out. It's actually the reason why I didn't went for the bolt game is because I really don't like the, the art design of Monster Hunter World. Uh, I, I think that it's I, I've played it I've played it a bit too much also which doesn't help but I think that it's a bit too generic it tries to go in for a little bit more realistic and so a lot of the weapons look the same and and I thought that it it kind of had that same slightly lifeless look uh, especially compared with other monster under game that are so much more vibrant in colors and in design and and try to go a bit more um, fantastical. Uh, that that is the one like slight dislike for this game is that uh, Monster Hunter World is uh, while while mechanically it is great um, in terms of uh, design and looks, uh, it maybe is a little bit uh, lesser than some of the other game uh, in my opinion. So yeah, yeah, stuff like Monster Hunter Rise has more cartoony ish, not really properly cartoony, but trending more towards cartoony looking, and I think that that's where Monster Hunter's aesthetic is at its best when it's not trying to be this realistic looking. Um, but that I, that lands at Capcom's feet, not at Steam. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, there is not an go on. Uh, just uh, especially since you know. Um one of the fun aspects of Monster Hunter is hitting a big monster with its own uh, tail that has been cut and that you're just holding by by a tiny little handle. Uh, yeah. it, it feels a bit uh, less fun when you it's just a big chunk of iron with some scales on it. Yep. Um, so the inserts have insufficient storage if you sleeve the cards. And i got to be honest, you need to sleeve the cards. You are shuffling the monster behavior deck the damage decks and the um, player, uh, the weapon attack decks, multiple times per fight. So they even though they're good quality, they're linen finish. They are going to wear out very fast. Um, if you're fine with that, sure. But like, I want to have them sleeved, um, and I didn't sleeve everything, and I have managed to fit them in the box, but with lift. Uh, if you try and put the cards in flat into the inserts when they've got um, uh, sleeves on them, the corners of the sleeves will bend. So, And it's, it's frustrating because they could have done a little better with this. It's not like there isn't the room for them to have done well. Um, likewise, the token holding section is just a tiny well that you chuck all the tokens in. I should have taken a picture so you guys could see it. But just imagine all you can do is jam all the tokens in in a mess. I, I can imagine um, it. There's a lot of board games that unfortunately you have this uh, flowing design. Hmm. Just yeah, tr the, chuck the, out uh, 20 different types of token together and then sort them out later. Yeah, yeah. the, the, um, the well, though, is like about two centimeters by five centimeters and about four <laughs> centimeters deep it's tiny it's tiny um yeah and considering they did some good work with like how they engineered the insert for the hunters and the monsters that's frustrating that they just kind of let it down there um in respect to the monsters the diablos the rathalos uh and nergigante come in pieces um this is something steamforge do quite often to try and cut down on space uh, I think it's okay, it's fine, but be aware the wings are taken on and off. And I had to reheat mine um, by putting them in hot water and forcing them in so they set in the correct way. They weren't quite right when they arrived, uh, but they're good now. Uh, monster, The monster like sculpts are amazing. They're yeah, really no, good. They, they were really I, I've done... Nice. Yeah, I've done what I do with games like this now as a test. I give myself no more than an hour per monster and I go airbrush, uh, sorry, undercoat, airbrush, uh, contrast paints and they they look great on the board 
Um, I can come back and paint them properly if I have the time in the future, but uh, who knows? Uh, I'm just happy with a quick bit of paint on them and stuff. That's they, they, it's a good job there. Uh, right, let's see. Um, oh yeah, uh, then there's a lack of tracking resources when you get them. They, you're literally doing it on pen and paper, and that's lots of writing rubbing off, writing rubbing off. You guys know what this is like. Ion, yeah, Ion Trespass, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I wore through the paper in Ion Trespass. I know I'll do the same with a... I, I did the same with a campaign for this as well. I, I rubbed through... Like, um, all I really needed was a, tra a board um, with the numbers on that I could track. And then if I'm packing away for a session, a pad where I can write where the, where the numbers are now. That's what I wanted. Um, uh, because also the resources are pooled in this. You can share, swap them back and forth as much as you like. Huge quality of life. Um, it cuts down the number of times you have to hunt the same monster, which I think is a good change um, compared to the video game, which I understand you're not necessarily playing with the same people all the time. So they're individual resources. Um, and then finally, and this is my biggest complaint, is the next Kickstarter. So they are they announced... Monster Hunter World Iceborne. Um, I love Iceborne and I am excited about that. Um, but this means that the Coral Highlands, the Rotten Vale, Elder's Recess, um, there's no like plan as far as we can tell for them to be released. Um, that means like no Valhazak, no Kirin. Um, we've got Tiostra, but no Lunestra. There's no Basilgeis, no Devil Hole. Like... This looks like it's going to be skipped. Uh, we're not going to see um, Odegaran either, unless things change. Um, oh, we might see I, I, the, the other ground that it, that appears in uh, in Iceborne. That is like a slightly different version of it. Yeah, but yeah, still. we we might do. But like for example, we've got the Rathalos and no Rathian. Yeah, which is oh yeah, yeah. yeah it is. Um, it is yeah. Kinda... Uh, yeah, it's it's just like that they, they, they it feels like they're um trying to rush through putting all of the content out like two games bam done and move on to the next thing and i want them to slow down because they've got a genuinely good boss battling game here that they could use as a framework to do the rest of like a second kickstarter to round out the remaining locations here maybe even do a xenogiva big exciting end game like yeah, I, boss battle there I, like a, thinking, a capstone i'm thinking there's a slight chance that they put some of the old locale into the um, into iceborne because iceborne only brings one new map uh, i guess two technically yeah too yeah uh maybe they'll they'll like do another one with uh elders recess and do like all of the elder dragon together or something i don't know we'll, we'll yeah. have to see yep. but it does seem like they are skipping to a fair amount of monster and fan favorite monster specifically and it's a bit weird that they did uh, kolo yaku and that they won't do devil joe yeah yeah it it is um that that's like my biggest uh shame is is like i said no odogar and no dodo dodo gama like best boy mm -hmm. where's dodo gama well, you don't dodo want to gama. kill dodo everyone gama. loves dodo gama mm? no no I, I want to hunt it and then claim that we've slept it at the end like we always do <laughs> um there's no sleeping capture mechanics in this uh no palomu um so i yeah i just feel like um it's early days and we might see in we won't know until we see what the kickstarter is but like they're so they've splashed rajang out and it's like oh yeah it's, it's the monkey the scary monkey and i'm of the opinion that like rajang should be like take a long time to get to in this board game oh yeah yeah it should be like yeah, one yeah. of the the, hand, the very 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 end, end game thing but with such yeah, it, a massive roster as as monster hunter especially if they decide at one point to go uh above and beyond uh, monster hunter world they, they mm. have so so many uh good ones that they could get to yeah so it is it, yeah it's just that that's exactly what i mean is there is so much content for them to work on and it does concern me a bit and i'm just like could we could we maybe um not rush this because you actually this is the this i think is the best game that they have put out um although i haven't played god tier so a lot of people really like god tier so anyway uh, that was a long conversation on Monster Hunter World, Very I'm long. afraid. Um, <laughs> I have nothing more to say except that my I, I have a wholehearted recommendation of this if you like boss battling games. But be aware, it is not afraid to 
tell you if you're not playing the weapon in the way you're supposed to be, it's going to dumpster you. And I am fine with that because there's so much mitigation here. Uh, so final thoughts from you guys. I... I, I... Oh, uh, you want to go? No, no, go for it, go for it, go for it. No, I I wanted just to add the thing that I think deserves to be said about the node movement. And uh, uh, it's true that uh, they are basically glorified squares, but there is uh, one smart interaction with monster movement. Monster uh, squadrons uh, for its facing handle, and uh, the movement, uh, we, we say the monster moves, but it moves on a D-pad and it moves uh, uh, closer to the hunter or uh, closer to the target or away from the target or sideways. And it does that uh, always facing the target. This means that when a monster moves sideways, uh, you can see it circling around you. And that was both unexpected and brilliant because the quadrants move and uh, relative position is changing, changes in a way that's organic and smart. And uh, I wanted to say that this is especially well done considered a game, uh, I have to name it, prime, like Primal, uh, where you only have monster quadrants and relative positioning to that. And this entire two-dimensional space uh, is sacrificed to abstract and uh, it's a shame because it works so well here. So that's basically my consideration that has not been said and I think it was worth the ser- it was deserving mesh be me- to be mentioned. It was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah that, that, I'm glad you mentioned it because yeah, the D-pad as well, that's what I mean about the aesthetic design when the, the iconography and yeah, the way it turns and moves and it's just like the game where they they keep facing you. They like keep their focus on their threat. So, yeah. Sometimes in quite a mechanical way too, which uh, works well here. Um, on, on, and Alexis, yeah. On my final thoughts, um, I really enjoyed it. I, I was I was um, surprised by how well the game emulates the different weapons. I, I've played the weapons that I that I played in the in the video games, and I was I was uh, happily surprised to to see that they play basically the same and that the same tactics can work and that oh. it feels very sorry sorry yeah. i just need to cut in how cool is it that the switch axe has two decks oh it's it's like... wonderful i wanted to talk about <laughs> uh, about that in detail the fact that you can st- choose from the two two decks and that one deck has a lot more stamina to dodge and the other is a lot more uh, heavy damage but you need to build a combo so you need the the switch the the axe thing that works exactly like in the game it's wonderful, but I would I would need ten minutes to talk about how brilliant that is. So it, it is it is great. Uh, the the gun lens is uh, extremely strong. Uh, very brief burst of super high damage, and then you need to go out, recharge, take a, a, a breath, uh, eat something, and then come back to the fight because you've uh, uh, completely exhausted yourself. It's great. Uh, really, really, really like the game. Um. So, uh, yeah, one of the things that uh, I felt through playing the game is that it feels like it, quote unquote, limits itself by the fact that it wants to emulate the video game so much. Like it, it will go to a certain length to make sure to be extremely uh, close to the video game. But I think that for this one, it works well. Um, for other games from from uh, from them, I've sometimes felt like they they kind of sacrifice the, the fun of the game just to try to be a little bit more like, oh, look, it's like that video game that you like. But for Monster Hunter, I think that they, they adapted it almost like perfectly in the way that it feels like the video games and it plays well. Um, one, the, the other slight thing that I found that was a, a bit annoying, uh, but that's that's the uh, kind of uh, the curse of uh, video game adaptation in board, in board game is that all of the art is um, a lot of the art is screenshot from the video game, and I think that looks just kind of uh, cheap uh, often. Um, yep, but yeah, otherwise, pretty amazing game. Yeah, I, I gotta say, innovative uh, new boss battlers should be looking at this for some examples of mechanics. 
Um, and I am excited about Iceborne. Okay. So that's my final word is uh, two thumbs up, massive recommendation for this. It's way above what I expected to be. I thought I was going to get some pretty Monster Hunter miniatures and a okay game like I did with uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. And I was not ready for how good this is. Uh, Jamie and you guys, like um, more of this, please. Okay, so this was Monster Hunter World, and unfortunately, uh, we spent a long, a long time talking about this amazing game. So we'll have to uh, push back uh, the uh, journey into Middle Earth in for another episode. But um, I think that's all the time that we have for this episode. So you can catch us at Patreon.com/thelastandy or The Last Andy on Twitter. Uh, and until next time, uh, we have been The Last Andy. So that will be a good time from Alessio. Goodbye. Goodbye from Fan. Uh, and myself. Uh, but remember that the second E in Standy stands for Elder. <laughs> <laughs>